Uh, so it's my pleasure to start off this team update. We're going to hear from everyone in the team, or at least a big part of the team, on everything that's been happening with Swarm. Uh, so normally, if you've seen my talks before, this is the part where I tell you what Swarm is and how it works. It's all about decentralized storage, serverless content storage distribution, and all the great stuff that Web3 needs, peer-to-peer -peer communication, and, you know, all that great stuff. But we don't have time for that today. So. Uh, you know, come find us, talk to us if you want to learn more about Swarm. Today it's all about the updates, what's been happening. So one of the things that's changed in the last year, we've updated our homepage because it needed an update, and it constantly does. But anyway, we've changed the address. So if you don't remember anything, just swarm.ethereum.org, as it says in the bottom, that will redirect you to the Swarm homepage. It'll redirect you to one hosted on Swarm, so most of the time it actually works. Um, <laughs> Hopefully. So you see up there, the, I want to point out, it says installation, downloads, and documentation. Those are the most important links because we've got updated documentation. The downloads, there's downloadable binaries. I'll get to that in a moment. Anyway, what I should have said is that the Swarm homepage is at bzz.theswarm.eth, but for that you will need a Swarm compatible browser. Not that many around, but this is advertising for the future. So we have a new release process. Um, Swarm now lives in the same GitHub repository as Geth. So we used to live in a, in a different fork, different repository, now it's the same place as Geth. If you get Geth code, you get Swarm code. That means whenever the Geth release is triggered, a Swarm release is triggered. There's no more separate releases, they all come at the same time. That makes it nice and easy. Whenever there is a release of Geth, there's a release of Swarm, and simultaneously all of the nodes on our cluster, the Swarm Gateways uh, cluster, are updated as well, so that always everything is running at the newest release version, the newest Geth release tag. And um, we are under heavy development, so we can and do introduce breaking changes quite regularly, um, so always make sure to update to this latest release. And there is actually, right now, a breaking change in the master branch, so at the next Geth release, there'll be a next Swarm release that breaks changes, so always stay up to date. Let me say that again, because it's important. Always go for the latest release before you ask us any questions. Okay, so having said that, let's talk about how installation works, because that's also gotten a lot easier in the past few months. Um, how to install Swarm? Well, there's always the option of installing from source code. Um, I said it's the same repository as Geth, so that's no mystery anymore. It's the Go Ethereum repository. The second one is to download binaries. If you go to our page and click on downloads, it will compile binaries for Windows, Mac, and Linux in both the release branch and the uh, master branch, unstable development leading edge. Um, if you're on Ubuntu, it's even easier because you can install um, from the uh, Ethereum PPA and then you'll, it'll automatically handle the updates for you. So you install it from there once, the Ethereum-swarm package, you will always automatically be on the latest release. And finally, we have Docker images also now available, so it makes it easy to deploy it in a dockerized environment. It's the ethdevops uh, swarm uh, repo, so there will always be newer binaries there, both in the, the latest tag will be the release version, and the edge tag is the bleeding edge. Okay, so now we're going to move on to team updates. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, various sub-projects. We're going to start off with feeds, which is a nice way of doing dynamic, change, constantly changing data in Swarm with only a single on-chain transaction to the ENS. Then uh, Donnie will talk about encryption and access control, how to keep data secure, make sure that only the right people see it. Um, Anton is gonna talk about observability, which is uh, about how we can actually observe what's happening in the Swarm and in our cluster with some really nice um, logging and tracing. Uh, Lewis will talk about PSS, which is the communications protocol that's piggybacking on top of the Swarm uh, network. Um, then uh, Victor will talk a little bit about uh, light nodes, how we plan to introduce mobile uh, phones into the Swarm network, and then what's on our roadmap, what's coming up next. So, um, yeah, let's have Javier up on stage, please. All right. Uh, Thank you very much for the chance to present. My name is Javier Pelletier. Uh, I'm the CTO of Epic Labs. Uh, I've been contributing to, uh, to Swarm since, uh, since May, since this May. Uh, and today I'm going to introduce you to one of the features that I worked with, uh, with the rest of the team called Swarm Feeds. Um, so what, what are Swarm Feeds uh, in, a, in a nutshell? So as, as, a, um, as a summary, it's a way to update content in Swarm. Okay, um, so it's a, a publisher-subscriber system. Okay, 
uh, where you can post updates about a topic uh, and then also read others, uh, others' updates about that topic. Okay? And you can also retrieve uh, all their values for those uh, posts. Um, and you can do all of that without any uh, single uh, blockchain transaction. Okay? Okay, it's not working. Okay, so you can think about uh, feeds uh, as a key value store, okay? Where each user can only write to their own key space, okay? You cannot overwrite somebody else's uh, uh, value, okay? And you can read your own values, okay? And, some, and everybody else's values, provided that you know uh, their address uh, and the topic they are posting at. And you can also retrieve all their versions of the values that you post, okay? And you can do all this without uh, uh, an Ethereum transaction, okay? So this opens up the, the door to many uh, dApps, okay, that do, do not have to do any transactions at all. Okay, so applications that we can do. We can alter, alter content in Swarm without ENS, okay? Uh, you can use ENS as well, but you don't have to. You can enable dApps to persist content easily. So from the browser, your browser application could save uh, to Swarm some value and retrieve it later. Um, you could use it to improve uh, uh, communication protocol among your applications. And also, uh, IoT devices could push information to Swarm uh, just by holding a private key, uh, and that's it. Okay, not, e not even ethers on that private key. So how, how does Swarm feed uh, work? Okay, to post to a Swarm feed, you need just two things. You need a private key, and uh, uh, you need a topic to post uh, that information under, okay? Um, I didn't say that you need ethers to post that update, just a private key that you can generate. Um, but, and to read a Swarm feed, the only thing that you need is the user's Ethereum address that you would be reading the feed from, and the topic under which that user is posting information. And optionally, uh, if you want, you can provide also a timestamp, which would allow you to uh, retrieve data in the past, okay? All their values for that key, you could retrieve as well. So uh, just to put up an example, let's imagine that uh, we have these sets of, um, uh, of topics uh, uh, on the left. Uh, for, for example, a topic could be avatar, uh, uh, another topic could be local weather, another topic could be website, and then we have uh, publishers uh, or users on top, you know, user A, user B, and user C. So in this case, for example, uh, user uh, A uh, has posted a, an update um, uh, under the avatar key, and the update is, uh, well, uh, her profile uh, information, no? her profile picture. Uh, so if we, if we use uh, the query feed uh, primitive in, in, in Swarm feeds, we can retrieve uh, that value that uh, she has posted, which is it's her picture, okay? Um, if the next day, for example, uh, uh, she updates her profile picture, the, the same uh, primitive call, uh, uh, which is uh, query feed, would return uh, the new picture. But if we provide uh, uh, a timestamp in the past, we can retrieve the older uh, picture as well, okay? So this enables, uh, again, any app to, to interact with Swarm in this way to save information and to publish information. Okay, so how would this work if we want to use this to publish a website. It's not the only application, but imagine that we want to use it to um, uh, update a website. As of today, uh, when we want to publish a website uh, uh, with ENS, uh, what we have to do is upload the content to Swarm uh, and get a hash out of that, and then we do an on-chain transaction to publish that hash, and uh, that way everybody can reach the content by the name. Uh, but then the problem is that when we want to update the, the site, uh, we need to publish the new hash, and that means going again to ENS and update the content hash, which is a, a, a another transaction cost, okay? So it means that every time that we update, we have to pay a transaction cost. With Swarm Feeds, uh, this is simplified uh, in a way that uh, you only have to do a uh, one ENS transaction just to have that ENS, trans, uh, ENS record, uh, my site.eth, for example, point uh, to the feed instead of to the direct content. And that, that way, uh, every time that you want to update the site, the only thing that you need to do is to, uh, to update the feed instead of to update the contract. So that way, here you go, you have a way to, to update a site without having to pay uh, uh, some ethers, you know, to, to get it done. Um, okay, so uh, the, the key takeaway here is you can update content without doing transactions. Uh, and you can start doing that uh, now because this is uh, already available in the, in the Swarm cluster. So there's uh, the Swarm guide that explains step by step how to start messing with it. So I recommend that you guys take a look uh, at all the uh, examples in there uh, to, to get it started step by step. 
Okay, great. Um, yes, yeah, so that was about how to get cont uh, you know, dynamic changing data in Swarm. Uh, next up, the two sections are by Daniel. Um, he will talk about uh, first encryption, which is the low level encryption of all the content in Swarm, and then about access control, which is making sure that only the right people read the right content. So, Donnie. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how you store confidential information in Swarm and how you uh, limit the uh, users uh, which can access it. So confidential information is in Swarm is encrypted using counter mode encryption, which you can find the basic security properties in Wikipedia. However, we use our own version of it, which is uh, a slight modification. So instead of the block cipher, which really is just a uh, one-way function with a reverse gear, which CTR encryption doesn't use anyway, uh, uh, we use SHA-3 twice, uh, which is the same uh, hash function that is used throughout Ethereum. And we use it twice because with accessing that little piece of data that is denoted by that pink arrow, what you can do is you can partially reveal uh, plain text inside a encrypted volume or a encrypted file in such a way that a smart contract can actually verify it, which means that you can make various commitments on the blockchain in smart contracts regarding the plain text of certain encrypted content. And if there's a dispute, you can reveal a piece of data that does not reveal your access keys or anything else, just reveals a little part of your encrypted uh, content, whatever it is. Uh, this is uh, vulnerable to what cryptographers call existential forgery, but if there's any uh, integrity protection in place, then uh, this is not actually a security problem. So this is how we encrypt. Uh, and in practice, for application developers, this means the following, that compared to unencrypted swarm, the references are no longer plainly uh, root hashes, but hashes of the ciphertext plus the decryption key. So they have grown from 32 to 64 bytes, but otherwise nothing else has changed. The API is exactly the same, and so is the data model, meaning that if you have already written distributed applications for Swarm or looked at the uh, example ones that we have in our public repository, they would work without modification on the encrypted uh, Swarm. So this is a native uh, encryption API on top of Swarm, and every Swarm node uh, supports it. And the only cryptographic assumption that we make is the security, the col collision resistance of the SHA-3 hash function. Now, so we have not actually increased the attack surface beyond what Ethereum already assumes. And you know, if SHA-3 is broken, then we will have much bigger problems. Uh, and finally, we have designed our encryption so that it's as smart contract friendly as possible. So now I'm going to move on to access control in Swarm, uh, which basically boils down to how do you change the sets of users that have access to certain content. So it's important to emphasize that in a permissionless, trustless, and distributed system, you can not really act as a gatekeeper, or you cannot really delegate nodes to act as gatekeepers. Instead, read access corresponds to the ability to decrypt, and write access corresponds to the ability to register. So registration can happen on swarm feeds or directly in the blockchain, for example, in an ENS contract, and that's about what you need to know about it. But read access, which is the ability to decrypt, is a bit more interesting, so I'm going to talk more about that. So there are three strategies in which you can identify uh, authorized users to access uh, content. The simplest and most intuitive, perhaps, is a passphrase. So you can make content accessible to users that know a particular passphrase. So in this case, both the publisher and the consumer needs to know that passphrase. 
which of course has the disadvantage if that if the same user needs to access content by two different publishers, then those two publishers can also access each other's content. Uh, so in order to mitigate that, we have a more sophisticated access control mechanism, which is public keys, public-private key pairs. Uh, and at this point, I would like to uh, draw your attention as developers that these public keys are not Ethereum addresses. These are actually points on the elliptic curve of which Ethereum addresses are the hashes. Uh, so you need, you need those in order to... Uh, I'd, as a publisher to identify your consumers, and as a consumer, you need to have the corresponding private key. And the most sophisticated and most finely grained uh, access control mechanism that we have implemented in Swarm is access control try, or ACT for short. This is basically a efficient uh, organization of access control lists. And in these lists, you can have users of both kind, so both passphrases and public keys, in such a way that uh, there's no information disclosed beyond a upper bound on the size of the ACL. So anybody who can access the uh, access control try can have a upper bound on how many items are there, but beyond that, they have no clue how many users can actually access it and who those are, even if you're one of them. You can only check whether or not you're one of them, but you cannot peek into other people's permissions. Uh, very importantly, since... Uh, access means ability to decrypt, you cannot really withdraw access. What happens if you exclude somebody from the access control list is that they're not going to be able to read future updates. They're still going to be able to read what they have read before, especially if, if they have cached all the keys that they have access to. But if the resource is updated, then they won't have access to the update anymore, only to the old versions. But it's also a very neat property that if you change the act, you don't need to re-encrypt the content because uh, we're using multi-stage encryption and you basically only need to re-encrypt the reference that I talked about earlier, the 64-byte uh, reference. Uh, also, Granting access, extending the uh, access control try is a logarithmic operation. So if you want to add another party to your access, then the, the number of encryptions that you need to do is a logarithm of the uh, number of grantees. Uh, revoking is a little bit more expensive. It's linear in the number of grantees, precisely because you want to re-encrypt a new uh, a new encrypted reference so that the, uh, those whom you have excluded will no longer have access to the updates. And finally, uh, I would like to uh, draw your attention that the granularity of this is very similar to that in a Unix file system, so you can have per directory permissions, per file permissions, and so on. So you don't need to have an entire swarm volume under the same uh, access control. Uh, so before I finish, uh, I would like to give you one warning, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, and hopefully this last one you remember, that if you're dealing with access controlled content, please, please don't use public gateways. Run your own swarm node. Because if you're using a public gateway, that gateway will have access to the same access controlled uh, content, and you might not want to have that. So, thank you so much. Um, all right. Uh, so, next up is Anton about observability. Hello, everyone. So, I'm going to talk about observability. Uh, in the last few months, we've implemented a lot of uh, observability tools in Swarm and also instrumented the code so that uh, you can use those tools. Um, what is observability? So observability is basically answering the question, what is my Swarm node doing at the moment? And if you are an operator of, let's say, a larger deployment like uh, us for the Swarm gateways, what is my 
full deployment doing? So basically an aggregate view of is your uh, network healthy and uh, basically um, how available it is. So observability in Swarm, um, what do we mean by that? So there are three pillars to it. So logging, metrics, and distributed tracing. So we do aggregate logging on all our Swarm nodes so that we can basically trace requests from one to another. Um, we do metrics aggregation and statistics, and we also do distributed tracing, so cross-node propagation of traces. Um, logging and metrics, uh, even though they're very useful, they're not uh, very interesting. They've been in the Go Ethereum code base for a while now. What we introduced is the open tracing framework, and we instrumented the whole Swarm code with it, which is basically vendor-neutral APIs for instrumentation. So what do we actually measure with those tools? As you can imagine, uh, the infrastructure metrics, so CPU, memory, disk utilization, so in case we have a bug in Swarm, um, we can detect like memory leaks or CPU starvation if we have, uh, let's say, goroutine leaks. And also very useful for us is the application metrics. So basically we track how many errors happen, how many warnings and other types of counters. When I say errors, I mean things that developers must look at. So let's say that we have unit, I mean, we have a um, elaborate unit test and integration test suite that catches a lot of things, but uh, errors is uh, what might happen, let's say, in production on our public test net, and that helps us debug problems for which um, the test suite is not enough. Other types of application metrics, uh, number of peers per node, so basically the different dev P2P nodes that your node is connected to, um, different protocol messages between the peers and pretty much anything that your node is running and that you want to gain visibility into. So I'm going to give you examples of how those tools look like. So that's one of them. Uh, we're using the open source Jaeger. It's a tracer that uh, hooks up with the open tracing framework. And here you can basically see a request that propagates from one swarm node to another and helps you get understanding of the underlying protocol. Um, I have to mention that we do this only for debug purposes. Obviously, we don't uh, run this in production, and you shouldn't really run it in production, but it helps for development purposes. And if you're building on top of Swarm, these tools are available for you to use and basically gain visibility. The other one is the aggregate logging. So, um, as I said, we have uh, request identifiers, so correlation IDs, and we can trace requests from one internal API to another and um, also track them across different nodes. Um, all those tools are available within the repo. There is uh, Swarm README, so if you're building tools on top of Swarm, this will be highly useful for you to answer the question what your Swarm is doing and basically gain visibility over it. So next, over to Aaron. Yeah, thanks. Um, that's actually, I mean, it sounds, you know, it sounds just like looking at logs, but that's actually really cool stuff. When like you see an action triggered in one node, onto the next, onto the next, onto the next, you can track like the action throughout the entire network. If you miss that, that's what this is doing. So it's a really cool view of what's going on. Um, talking of moving things from node to node, our next speaker is Lewis about PSS. Hello, everyone. How does this work? The green button to go forward yeah. and the red to go backward. Oh, this is pretty clear. Hello, I'm Lewis Solbrook. I'm a, a responsible or maybe irresponsible party of the implementation of uh, PSS. And PSS is, uh, as Aaron said earlier, a messaging platform that piggybacks um, the, does it work or? That green button, I see. Yeah, that uh, piggybacks the swarm uh, routing mechanism to send ephemeral data um, across the uh, across the network, um, inter-node uh, messaging. And what does that mean? Well, it means that um, we um, that we increase the efficiency of delivering messages, and um, uh, therefore. Um, 
it comes at the expense of secrecy. So this answers a question that a lot of people answer, uh, a lot of people ask generally about why do we need this PSS thing when we have the whispers and whisper the messaging platform of, of, of uh, Ethereum? Well, that's your answer. That um, is whisper primarily focused on the property of privacy and darkness. Uh, PSS gives you the possibility to actually efficiently, uh, efficiently root over the, uh, over the network. And since we all know that there are no such things as ninja mailmen, you kind of have to choose between one or the other. Um, all nodes in Swarm take part in this routing. So, um, um, and it's also enabled by default. So you can't deactivate PSS from Swarm as such. So what are the general features of Swarm? Well, first of all, this is not really a feature, but um, um, I already did a couple of talks on PSS DevCon last year. That's why I won't go into technical details about how it works. But at that time, it was in a very obscure branch in development. Since then, it's actually merged into the main code base. So that means that when you download a Swarm binary, it actually has PSS and stuff in there. It also means that it passed some tests, um, which is good news, right? Um, <clears throat> so, what does it provide? Custom luminosity. So, I said that um, PSS gives you the possibility of efficiently routing. So, it means that, what happened now? Yeah, slide gone. Well, anyway, so it gives you the possibility to uh, define exactly which address in the network you want to send the message to. Um, in this case, uh, it will it will um, it will reach the message in maximum of logarithmic hops of the address space. Uh, but it also gives you the possibility of partially selecting an address or not selecting an address at all. Now, not selecting an address at all would we give the same consequences whisper, it would be spread all over the network, and uh, whoever can decrypt the message, for example, is intended to a recipient. Still no slide, I don't know what's going on. And, huh? Oh, I see, so I have to remember what the slides are, that's pretty cool. Um, and <laughs> partial addressing could be, you know, for example, you send an ad, uh, a message to Prague, or you send a message to the convention center in Prague, or you send a message to Lewis at the convention center in Prague, and I only use Lewis because I'm selfish, that's my name, and I know there happens to be another Lewis here at the conference. Or you could say, uh, Lewis with the fried egg tie at the convention center in Prague, which probably pretty much would narrow it down to me, and that would be the full address. Oh, they're back, and I, Level. Let's see. We can go back. Right. Swarm has, uh, PSS has built an encryption by default, so it means that it um, handles uh, generation of keys and also uh, sending um, all the encryption happens um, behind the API. There are pluggable code handlers, which means that uh, for every, um, so every message has a certain topic and associated to that topic as a recipient, you can register code to be executed when you get a message for that topic. And it can be any number of handlers. So it's uh, extendable, very flexible. There is a handshake module which uh, enables you to do Diffie-Hellman handshakes and exchange session keys behind the scenes. Um, happens automatically. The keys are valid for a certain number of messages. And there is also a buffer of keys so that if you run out of, uh, if you, the exchange, the refreshment of keys happen before you run out of keys so that you won't be stuck if, if, um, if, uh, um, uh, so it's less likely you get stuck. Um, protocols, yes. So um, it has a framework, so PSS has a framework for inter-machine uh, communication. It also so happens that it's designed a way so that if you have already dev P2P protocol that exists between two directly connected peers, directly in the sense of TCP, you can with minimal, minimal code actually port this to PSS. Um, so by newest features, I mean, so all of this stuff that I said now, I kind of said last year. But so again, the difference is it's in the code base now, right? Or it's in the, it's in the main binary. This is new since last time, but also part of the merge. Deduplication, last, um, when we last heard from this, you, you had the risk of uh, getting the same message twice in BSS. This is now much less likely. Um, uh, when messages are um, exchanged on the, um, PSS network, they have an expiry, and um, the um, nodes will also have a um, certain period of time where they don't allow the same, uh, the message, an identical message to pass, or an identical message to go in. So that will make it less likely, not 100% guarantee, but actually less likely that you have to handle the duplication of messages yourself. Raw messages, which means uh, it doesn't, um, 
you actually have a possibility of handling the encryption outside of PSS yourself, or just send plain text messages, if you will, if the, if the secrecy is not important. And um, last of all, a notifications package. So it basically means a protocol which makes it really easy to subscribe and publish notifications. And um, um, it just provides a kind of a channel which you, your code can pump stuff into, and then a very simple protocol where uh, nodes send um, subscribe message to the node that's uh, publishing, and then automatically gets uh, notifications via PSS. For example, in combination with uh, swarm feeds, as we heard from Javier, this can be a really powerful feature. Yeah, pull as well as push. Now there is an API, of course. Um, uh, most applications in Swarm use, um, are available through IPC, WebSockets, HTTP, and CLI. PSS, unfortunately, or is only IPC and WebSockets because we need subscriptions to get incoming messages. There is uh, API, it's of course all documented. Unfortunately, though, it's kind of low level, so if you want to interact with it, it kind of looks like this. At least that's what we provide. Fortunately, there is a community out there um, that are also collaborating to Swarm development, among them Mindframe, that have created a JavaScript um, library called Erebus, which, as you can see, makes it a little more human-friendly to interact with PSS as such. So, uh, for the documentation, um, Swarm Guide, of course, Erebus also has its own documentation page, and um, uh, at the bottom is uh, my repository where there are some tutorial examples, or uh, code examples for tutorial for PSS. I would also like to mention that Victor uh, is having a talk later today on um, the higher level vision of PSS and how it can interact with feeds, as I mentioned, and also access control, um, as um, uh, Daniel was talking about. I can't remember exactly the where it was or when it was, but if you follow this link, I mean, everybody takes pictures of the screen, right, when these links come, then you probably can find it. And I think that's it. So yeah, the, the talk is at the Fluence Meetup tonight at six o'clock. There's going to be four of us talking from Line, Life Peer, uh, New Cipher, Fluence, and, and Swarm. And I'm going to talk about my vision of how to how to uh, <clears throat> basically reformulate uh, communication protocols. Yes, you heard it well, all of them. Uh, in terms of in terms of uh, tools that that are available for Web3, so basically have communication that's decentralized, incentivized, and secured. Uh, thanks to our friends from B3 for the motto. So uh, now talk about like nodes. So uh, we, we realized early on that we, we need to distinguish between uh, two types of nodes, ones that, uh, that are constantly online and therefore are reliable for, for storing chunks, and the nodes that uh, have high churn, basically that you just open your laptop and close it, and, or, or, or you have your mobile device. And in general, that's, we, we call this, this this distinction uh, light node as opposed to full node, or light mode of operation, maybe you can call it. It's basically about mobile support. Let's 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 simplify the things. So it's 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 concerned with not only the high churn but also uh, the, the difference in the in the resources of the environment, the, the resources that are available for Swarm. So lo low bandwidth, usually probably low low memory as well, and short on disk space, and uh, and there, there's there's various issues that we came across by. When, when trying to support uh, uh, mobiles. Uh, some of them are kind of boring uh, platform specific issues. I'm not gonna talk about them, permission issues. Uh, and uh, so, so in general, what's, what's, the, what's the chance of a res restricted resource uh, client to, to, to connect to Swarm? Well, there's, there's uh, post potential gateways, like gateways that might be accessible for, through others, like for example, the one that the, the, the Swarm team or the Ethereum Foundation is running, the Swarm cluster, which we run a public gateway. This is not really uh, intended to be long term. This is kind of a, just for, for, for easy access now through the development. But obviously, it's, uh, when the incentivization is coming on the mainnet, this is going to cost money. So we, we might only do that for marketing pur purposes for short term. But and as, as you heard as well, you, uh, remote gateways are not appropriate for, for uh, hosting uh, or so to, to retrieve uh, encrypted content from. There's also, there's also private gateway solutions, so you run your own uh, remote node. For example, that, that, that node is, uh, is uh, supporting that. 
And, and what, we, what I'm going to talk about here is, is just light mode of operation, which is like how we natively support uh, this, this type of operation where you have low resource environments. So basically, we, we distinguish these two, two, two node types. And in the, in the zero phase, what we already accomplished, kind of almost, almost dev ready, is that uh, light nodes, when light nodes are, are treated differently. They are not saved in the address book of, of, of your peers. They are not dialed, so actively looked for. They just accept it as a connection. They don't, stay, since they don't store chunks, they, they also not uh, doing syncing process. So they, they're not syncing, not, not taking part in the, in the transport of, of, of chunks to their, to their uh, local neighborhood where they, where they belong in, in the distributed storage of, of Swarm. They're not serving retrieve requests since they cannot store. And, and also, to, in order to respect the redundancy properties of Swarm, they also not counted in the local neighborhood. So once we have that, we, we are, we're going to be a lot more tolerable uh, towards uh, high churn. And if, if, especially if we set the, the light node as, as the default mode of operation, and people who, who run like permanent nodes, we explicitly have to set it to full nodes. So this, this will uh, contribute to the resilience of, of our network. Now, uh, uh, I, I talk about the roadmap. So what's coming up next, we, 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 we started rewriting the, the swap protocol, the, the swarm accounting protocol, which is basically the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, tit for tat accounting that's serving as bandwidth incentivization and serving to, 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 to regulate and, and basically optimize uh, bandwidth resource allocation. And uh, we, we, we ported the old code and, and uh, actually re rewrote quite, quite a bit of it and simplified the code. So that's, that's what's going to come up next in, 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 in a few releases time. We are, we are uh, planning on uh, introducing spam protection. So basically protection against uh, people flooding uh, the, the swarm network with chunks by uh, having to attach by making, it, making sure that people have to attach a proof of burn, so some sort of basically proof of work uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the chunks. And, and also uh, the first phase of erasure coding is going to be implemented very soon, uh, which takes care of, basically it's not uh, the erasure coding, uh, uh, so the, there's two layers of erasure coding. One would be to take care of catastrophic loss. And this one, the, the first phase, is just guarantees, uh, basically, gives an upper bound to the, to the re retrieval latency in the network. So uh, that's, that's, that's in, the, in the immediate roadmap. Also on the, on the, in the immediate roadmap, that we, we, we're kind of moving to a new cluster setting. So we're going to be able to spawn uh, really big scale, scale, scale level uh, network tests in a, in a real setting. So uh, that's, that's Anton, Anton and uh, Raphael are working on a Kubernetes cluster that's, that's, that's going to be able to uh, start spot instances. And, and therefore, our, our network testing framework is, is going to be <coughs> able to test like really complicated emergent network scenarios. Okay, so uh, what, what else is on the roadmap? As, 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 as usual, we're still uh, very heavily researching uh, how, how exactly we do storage insurance. Then we, we, we now, we now uh, have like a two-layered system that's, that's we, we're planning. Uh, the the, the swap and swindle framework, which is a generic framework for, for uh, basically our, our, our take on state channel networks and, and also a, a, a contract support for, for service uh, level agreements that are challengeable on the blockchain. So it's kind of a, uh, our, our take on state channels combined with the blockchain as a judge paradigm. So the swaps and, and swindle contract suite uh, has been uh, developed and, and uh, uh, tested with, uh, by, by Ralph Pilher from, from Riyadh. So our, our, it's on our roadmap to finish this, this part and, and introduce the, the, the option to have like service networks on Swarm. There's heavy research on, on databases on Swarm. And we, we, we realized that there's a lot of usability issues in general with Swarm. So, so we, we're going to put a lot more effort into, into developing and supporting uh, uh, dev tooling, so basically bindings in various languages and most prominently uh, provide better JavaScript support. We're together with some of our friends and, and allies in the ecosystem. So uh, that's about it for the update. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you, Victor.
So I said that's about it. Um, it would be a miss at this point if we didn't mention that there's more to Swarm than just the Swarm team. The community has grown this year. We've gotten a lot of contributions from third parties. The always awesome mainframe uh, status has been helping us with the um, mobile devices. We've got Volk on databases. Data Fund is awesome. They make orange sweatshirts and other orange gear for us. That's <laughs> wonderful, guys. So thank you, everyone on this list and everyone else who's joining the Swarm community. Um, this is the team at the Orange Summit last year. We have one Swarm Orange Summit every year. Uh, we're hopefully have one next year, so you're welcome to attend. Keep a lookout for that. Um, here's our contact. We have, um, I've already mentioned swarm.ethereum.org. We've started our own Twitter and Reddit called ETH Swarm. I promise there's not a lot in there. This is a low <laughs> traffic environment, but that's where you get updates. We'll make release announcements, uh, and when we have a talk somewhere or when our orange summit is coming up, that's where you look. Um, that's our Gitter, swarm at ethereum.org. If you want to talk, if you want to write to us directly, otherwise, come find someone in orange at the conference and come talk to us. Thank you very much.